Mr Speaker, after 13 years of Conservative mismanagement, patients are waiting longer than ever before. Heart attack and stroke victims are waiting more than an hour and a half for an ambulance. 24 hours in A&E isn't just a TV programme, it is the grim reality for far too many patients. 7.2 million people are waiting for NHS treatment. Why? The front door is broken. People are finding it impossible to get a GP appointment, so they end up in A&E. At the same time, the exit door is broken because care in the community is not available. Patients are trapped in hospitals, sometimes for months. And in between the two is a workforce that is overstretched, burnt out, ignored by government ministers and forced out on strike. Does this plan even attempt to get patients a GP appointment sooner? No. Does this plan restore district nursing so patients can be cared for in the comfort of their own homes? No. Does this plan see ministers swallowing their pride and entering negotiations with nurses and paramedics? No. And does this plan expand the number of doctors and nurses needed to treat patients on time again? No. The Health Secretary said a lot of things, Mr Speaker, but he did not say when patients can expect to see a return to safe waiting times. His colleague, the Minister for Social Care, rather let the cat out of the bag this morning. She was asked, and I quote, is there any plan at all for when we will get back to 95 per cent of patients in A&E being seen within four hours? She responded, and I'm not joking, her answer was, and I quote, I can't tell you that. How can he claim his plan is ambitious and credible? What kind of emergency care plan doesn't even attempt to return waiting times to safe levels? It's a plan that is setting the NHS up to fail right from the start. A plan for managed decline. These targets are not plucked out of thin air. Patients waiting more than five hours in A&E are more likely to lose their lives. So are heart attack and stroke victims waiting more than 18 minutes for an ambulance. Sadly, that is exactly what has happened this winter. It is what happened this summer, and it has been going on since before the pandemic began. The four-hour A&E waiting time target hasn't been met since 2015. The only time the Conservatives have met the 18-minute target for ambulance response times was during lockdown. What's his ambition now? 30 minutes. 30 minutes waiting for a heart attack and stroke victim to receive an ambulance when every second counts. Isn't it the truth that they miss the targets so they are moving the goalposts, fiddling the figures rather than fixing the crisis? And he boasts that he's pouring more money in, £14 billion, almost as much as his department has wasted on dodgy, unusable PPE. Yet standards are being watered down. So can he explain why patients are paying more in tax but waiting longer for care? Why is it that under the Conservatives we are always paying more but getting less? So what is their answer? I quote again. There are so many people in hospital who wouldn't need to be there if we could provide quality care at home. Medical science and technology offers a world of possibility for the NHS to transform patient care. Virtual wards allow people to receive hospital care at home. End quotes. Those aren't the Secretary of State's words, Mr Speaker. That's my party conference speech. He didn't have a plan for the NHS, so he's nicking Labour's. Now, I'm happy for him to adopt Labour's plans, but here is what he missed. You cannot provide good care in the community, in people's homes or in the hospital without the staff to care for people. That is the supermassive black hole in his plan published today. People. Virtual wards without any staff isn't hospital at home, it is home alone. So where is his plan to restore care in the community? Labour will double the number of district nurses qualifying every year. So can he hurry up and nick that plan too? And of course, good care in the community is not a substitute for good care in hospital. We need both now. So why 
in the middle of the biggest crisis in the history of the NHS, with hospitals so obviously short of staff, is his university's minister writing to medical schools to tell them not to train any more doctors. This is ludicrous. Labour will double the number of medical school places and create 10,000 new nursing and midwifery clinical placements, all paid for by abolishing the non-DOM tax status. Now, I know, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister might not like that last bit. The Prime Minister might not like that last bit. They're all, they're all complaining opposite, but they didn't complain when they put up income tax, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister doesn't like it, but perhaps this would be a good time for the Conservatives to act tough on tax dodgers. So when is he going to nick that plan? And when is he finally going to get his act together and end the strikes in the NHS? Or perhaps I'm speaking to the monkey when the Chancellor is the organ grinder. If that's the case, Mr Speaker, then when will we get a chance to question the real Health Secretary on the strikes this one is causing in the NHS? Labour will create more front doors in the NHS. We will tackle the crisis in social care. He offers sticking plasters. And by now, Mr Speaker, it's very clear. Only Labour can offer patients the fresh start the NHS needs. Well, Mr Speaker, he started off, he started off by thanking for advanced sight of the statement and then gave a series of remarks that simply ignored what was in the statement. Uh, and even his last point, his last point just shows how riddled with contradictions the approach from the opposition bench is. He says in interviews that he supports the pay review body process. That is the official position, or at least was. Then he says, no, we should be negotiating individually with the trade unions uh, and disregarding the pay review process. So there's no consistency on that uh, at all. He, he talks about uh, operational performance. You just had your go. You can hear the answers. Uh, he says that uh, it's about uh, operational performance. And I, Mr Speaker, my remarks, try to be fair to the fact that actually these are uh, challenges that are shared across the United Kingdom. Uh, they're shared globally. He seemed to think that these were just unique to England alone, and yet you only need to look at the fact more than 50,000 people in Wales, notwithstanding it's a smaller population, but more than 50,000 in Wales are waiting over two years for their operation when we cleared that uh, in the summer in England with fewer than 2,000 uh, in that cohort. Uh, he talks about workforce, Mr Speaker, obviously didn't bother to read what we said in the statement. We're on track to deliver our manifesto commitment at over 50,000 nurses. We've got over 30,000 so far. If one just looks, compared to last year, Mr Speaker, 10,500 more nurses in the NHS this year compared to last year. Now, the grown-up position, the grown -up position is to recognise, well, the first five years we were dealing with the letter that said no money was left. So, you know, so the first five years were indeed... They don't. They don't seem to like the response, Mr. Speaker. But the facts speak for themselves. Ten and a half thousand more nurses this year than last year. But the grown-up positions didn't recognise that we have an older population. They have more complex needs, and the consequences of the pandemic are severe. They're severe in England, but they're severe across the United Kingdom, in Wales, in Scotland, and indeed in other uh, countries across the globe. He says that the statement didn't cover the plan for GPs. Well, again, I was clear that this was one of three plans. We had the elected plan in the summer, which hit its first milestone. We have the second component today in terms of urgent and emergency care, and we will set out in the coming weeks through uh, the work that my, my colleague on the front bench is doing, our approach in terms of primary care. Uh, and that is, that is uh, the approach that we're taking. We're keeps country 30 years. We didn't have the pandemic 13 years uh, ago. So, of course, we... Uh, well, I can only surmise, Mr Speaker, that he didn't quite get his remarks right, which is why he feels the need to keep chuntering now and have a second, a third and a fourth uh, go. Um, but uh, perhaps next time. Uh, on uh, ambition, uh, he ignores the fact that we need to balance being ambitious but being realistic, and these uh, metrics are uh, in the view of NHS England, uh, the fastest sustained improvement in NHS history. Uh, so clearly he is at odds with NHS England in those remarks. Um, on funding, uh, we're putting in an extra £14.1 billion of funding into health 
and social care over the next two years, which reflects the fact that notwithstanding the many competing pressures that the Chancellor faced at the autumn statement, he prioritised health and social care alongside education as the key areas that were prioritised, notwithstanding the other competing challenges. Uh, and on uh, virtual wards, I hadn't quite realised that he was the clinician that had invented virtual wards. Uh, I actually think the credit for virtual wards goes to the staff such as those I met at Watford, who are the ones who are driving forward uh, that innovation. Uh, and it's slightly strange that he wants to uh, sometimes claim ownership of something that has been clinically led by those working at the front line.